Hello, everyone. I'm Janet Salmons, Research Community Manager for Sage Method Space, and I'm pleased to be joined today by Safari Wabaleka and a group of contributors to this new handbook about online higher education. But before we get started with our conversation, um, if you are new to Method Space, um, this is a blog community sponsored by Sage Publishing. And we are interested in everything to do with designing, conducting, analyzing research, uh, writing about it, sharing results in all different kinds of ways. And you can see at the heart of this diagram, we have teaching and learning, which of course is our focus here today. But in Method Space, we think whether you are a brand new researcher or an experienced researcher, we all have something to learn, um, which is why I find uh, this opportunity so exciting. And of course, here we are walking the talk because uh, what we do with Method Space is try to offer materials for people who are learning a new method, want to refresh their uh, knowledge about uh, new approaches, find out what's going on in the world, learn new skills. Um, and, and here we are online uh, having this uh, conversation. So Safari, why don't you um, uh, begin by introducing yourself and uh, if each of you could uh, introduce yourselves and, and tell us a little bit about where you're from and what you contributed to this handbook. Uh, I'm Safari Wambaleka. I'm the lead editor of this book. I'm an associate professor of leadership in higher education, but I teach uh, primarily doctoral uh, research courses at Bethel University in Minnesota, here in the United States. I live in Maryland, so this is uh, something I'm practicing. I teach uh, fully remotely. I don't live on campus. The campus is two hours flight away from where I live. So it is uh, uh, wonderful to have my colleagues here to talk about these topics of uh, online higher education, because I know all of them have been involved in many different ways from many different regions of the world. Onesimus? Yes, thank you so much. My name is Onesimus Otieno. I'm a professor of biological sciences at Oakwood University in Huntsville, Alabama. Well, uh, part of the things that I enjoy doing is training faculty on online pedagogy, mostly on the African continent. And I have done probably going to close to at least eight years doing that. And we started by infusing critical thinking into the curriculum and then eventually into online education and so on. So in terms of the book, I wrote on quality assurance processes within online learning. Let's go to Kim. Perfect. Hi, my name is Kim Welch. I'm an instructional designer at Arizona State University, but I live in California. So I do the remote thing as well like Safari does. Um, and then actually my job right now is mostly with um, professors in Africa. We're um, doing a, a major push in Ethiopia to help them to learn how to teach online. So that's that's kind of what I've done. And I've worked quite quite a lot with Anesimus and Safari, and I'm excited to meet Relita as well. For this book, I'm actually just kind of a sidelight. I've read it more than I've contributed to it. So Safari and I have worked together a little bit, and I've been able to read some of his work. So I'm excited to be here to share with you, and I'm excited to meet Relita as well. Thank you, Relita. Please talk to us. Yes, all right. Thank you so much. It's really lovely to connect with everyone here. And for me, basically, I'm currently based in Ghana, and I'm originally from design and also educational technology background, and those are the courses that I'm teaching every day. But I also work with the University of Cape Town through the Image Africa Network, where we are constantly training educators and professionals across Africa and beyond within our network online. And so it's really nice to be here and to connect with all of you. And then, of course, um, to meet familiar faces like Gunasmos. Yes, through the MasterCard program, we've also engaged a bit from KNUSD as well through our e-learning center, where I also work as an instructional designer for the KNUSD e-learning center. So really, I'm happy to be here and 
yeah, to share our experiences with everyone. Yeah, so thank you. Over to you, Safari. Janet, do you want Please. to get started with this conversation? Yeah, so, um, as, as you've all described, you've had a long experience of working with online education and thinking about what makes it work <clears throat> from the pedagogical side. But a lot of people just started thinking about the possibility of online learning uh, during the pandemic. Um, how did uh, that the COVID-19 um, pandemic affect online education in, in higher ed uh, in your experience? Well, thank you, Janet. I'll take that first. And uh, my uh, observation is that I believe that COVID-19 was the single largest impact on academia in the history of academia. Mm -hmm. And uh, UNESCO estimates this to be around, it affected like uh, 1.5 billion learners around the world. 36 countries closed schools for up to 41 weeks. So this is going to be a huge dent in the history mm -hmm. of uh, academia globally. And I like to look at it in one way. Just think about going to a football stadium and we have the team and the players in the field and the referee. And then you have thousands of spectators watching and something happens and everybody runs into the field and starts doing everything. <laughs> and so it's chaotic. We don't have rules. We just, everyone's in there trying to do something. And then somehow when all this eases out, we have to figure out who stays in the field, who gets out, who gets to watch the other one, what lessons have we learned? So there's a lot of, I mean, it's literally a global experiment on mm -hmm. uh, delivery of education. And a lot has been learned. We have tested our infra infrastructure. We have learned a lot. And now there is not even turning back because even if we wanted to go back, this experience is some of those things that we have invested in are basically bound to stay. We don't know if we will have anything similar coming up. So literally we got into a new normal. What this new normal is, is what we are still trying to figure out while we assert in what we have learned and affirm some of the structures that we have put in place. And literally, it has now become very easy to convince institutions and learners and teachers to basically go online because everybody has, has, has had a taste of it. So in a way, it's easier to get to promote online education, the question is, how do we maintain some sense of what is successful and what is not? Right. And that's the purpose of the handbook. Right. Um, I, I have had the privilege to work in the US, in Asia and Africa uh, over the years. And I was one of the, I think one of the first people to embrace online. I started teaching online in 2003 and uh, I, I saw the resistance here in the US and within four years, it kind of went away. I remember moving to Asia where most people were not online and what was called online was not really quality online uh, higher education. Mm -hmm. Then I moved to Africa to, to work there. Right before the COVID-19, the resistance was, I think, the top level of the world that no you know we don't trust these things and for some good reasons that we discuss in the handbook um and i can say that as honestly said covid-19 just came and dismantled all those um, misconceptions and resistance everybody just got their <laughs> their shells off and they were running for for online higher education Although some people are trying to go back to the traditional thing, I don't think that um, we, people will go fully traditional because uh, COVID-19 has, has opened new opportunities for 
for, for learning new opportunities, for teaching new opportunities, for institutions to grow. So, so maybe before we uh, <clears throat> go on, it would be useful to talk about the different types of online learning. Um, so why don't we, uh, you know, try to try to describe some of the different uh, options. Kim, do you want to take that? I can try. I mean, I can, you know, if that that's a very open ended yeah. question. So you can add on when yeah. what I what you know, fill in the gaps that I leave. Um, so at Arizona State University, for example, we have a lot of online asynchronous learning. Um, we have a, a very large program. So 60,000 undergraduate students who are online. So it's it's fairly big. Um, and these are asynchronous. So we bring in very specific students who um, maybe are already working, they're professionals or um, mm -hmm. you know, coming back in for their degree after they've started working, they have families. And so we do a lot of asynchronous work with them where um, you know, it's they they work through a system. We actually do them in seven and a half week sessions quite often. So instead of the full 15 week semester, we'll do these seven and a half week sessions and then break content up into those types of things. And so that's an asynchronous model that we do. And we've done quite a bit with it. For example, in our zoology group, they'll send a fish out to these people and they the people have to dissect the fish with a video. And, you know, there's there are certain activities and things that we've created to kind of mimic some experiences that they might have even in labs and such going into a, a physical classroom. Um, so we do a lot of that. It, it makes the implementation of very strategic technologies important. And so we do that. Um, but we also, you know, when, when COVID hit for me, um, I was working as um, an instructional designer at a, a university in Southern California. And I was, I, I'll, I'll say that it was like the last brick and mortar, you know, physical contact type university. They didn't want anything online. And so when things hit, we had to suddenly turn online there, but they wanted more of the synchronous model where they were doing more of that interaction with people because they really wanted that interaction with the students and the mm -hmm. student population was of that type as well, who wanted that community building in a synchronous space. And so that's a different model. And we taught to that. So being an instructional designer, we taught to that. I was also a French teacher at the time. I have a background in teaching French and English. So I was I was doing the same thing that these professors were doing. And that's a different model, different type of learning, um, different requirements. And again, strategic placement of technologies at that point, what kind of technologies are used mm -hmm. in that kind of environment. So those are a couple of different models that we used, but I'll, I'll stop talking now and let others fill in some gaps where I've left. Yes. What are what are some of the other you know models or I, mean, I think the the synchronous versus asynchronous, you know, as you say, the asynchronous model that that allows for uh, flexibility across time zones and you know people are doing their work at two in the afternoon or two in the morning. It doesn't matter. It's they've they can fit it in with other parts of their lives. But on the other side, the synchronous, like the kind of environment we are in now, where you have that you know, a sense of presence with other people and real time conversation where, you know, you can have questions, response, discussion, um, you know, and, and be able to see each other or even to see other materials, just as I should slides at, at the beginning of this, um, we could be demonstrating, connect with other applications or media, etc. What What other styles of have um, you used uh, in in your other in your other schools. Let's hear from Ghana. Oh, all right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Kim, for sharing that. You know, for us, I'll I will speak within the context of uh, Ghana, and then a bit about what we are also doing from Emerge Africa as well. So, for us within um, KNUSD, we kind of. Uh, combine the synchronous and also the asynchronous, okay? Then we also have the, uh, what we call it, the solely, now we've moved solely to the asynchronous for some of the courses, not all the courses. And then we have the one that we have the combination of the two. So the asynchronous ones would um, really align with what you were sharing with, with regards to what's happening within your university 
And then we have those that we have the live interactions like this with also the asynchronous ones. And then at the same time, we have the blended um, learning, okay, where we are combining uh, online with also the in-person interactions. Mm -hmm. But the advantage to all of this is that we are able to tailor um, these learning activities to the different kinds of students that we have because we are getting people from all walks of life and professionals and all of that, including even our undergraduate students. So we have to actually be a bit flexible with all of these um, online interactions so that we'll be able to meet every um, learner at the point of their need. So that was the advantage we got. And then within the Image Africa space, we do a lot of the asynchronous and then the synchronous interactions. And most of our training activities have actually have live um, facilitators guiding the activity. So that kind of makes it different from other online engagement. So everything is really live when we actually um, have to interact with, with the participants. So that's um, one of the things that we have differently within our, our context and also with that from Image Africa, which give us the chance to train and constantly training different people mm -hmm. across the world. Yeah. So um what what I can add to that, and, and I think we've seen this that there are three major well-established models, the synchronous online, which is uh, like Zoom classes, and then we have asynchronous where you most of the times we never have the live session, and then something in the middle. And what we saw at, during the COVID-19, uh, and we discussed this in, I think, in the first chapter, I believe it's the first chapter of this handbook, where it becomes much, it becomes much more of a spectrum, uh, a continuum. Mm -hmm. So we have something on the far left, the other one on the far right, and something in the middle. But between these three points, there is also something where, for example, if you're teaching face-to-face, -face, um, you may have some activities, very few, maybe 20% of your class is online. Um, or if it is fully online, you have uh, maybe 20% that would be live discussion. And uh, this became very clear during COVID-19. Before, before COVID-19, I think it was just more people thinking about it, but this time it became very, very practical. So um, uh, in your work with uh, pedagogy, um, how, how do you um, explain you know, kind of these different options and what that means for the teaching and learning? I think this goes together with uh, with uh, administration of the the instruction. They have to come up with a model that is going to be used because you don't want each professor doing their own thing because mm -hmm. students are the same. You don't want right. students taking three classes from three different people using three different models. And so um, what I have seen uh, ha happening, at least from personal experience, is that, okay, this is how we're going to do it. It's going to be asynchronous and that's it. Uh, and that, which is the 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 common format mm. that we use here in uh, in the United States, uh, at least for universities that are fully online universities, it they are mainly asynchronous. Um, or if you say, well, we're going to have blended blended learning, and this is why we want blended learning. I would see that I would say that when I was working in, in Africa and Kenya, this is the model that we use because we didn't want students spending too much time in a live session. Um, because of uh, data, internet connection, the electricity issues that mm -hmm. were happening around the continent. Um, so we, we needed to be practical, have less live sessions and a bit more uh, synchronous, but all the classes would go with the same format. I don't know about uh, Onesimus, what your experience has been. Yes, thank you, Safari. Uh, what I've noticed is of course, we have synchronous, asynchronous, and then we have blended. So institutions pretty much decide to pick one or a few, but even more importantly is being able to define what blended is and defining what asynchronous is. I think that has been the biggest challenge, but mm -hmm. more importantly is that an institution, first of all, defines what is synchronous, what is asynchronous, what is blended. And then 
they also have this other term, they say high flex. So there are several terms, but being able to define what that means. That way, when a student takes a course and it says it is blended, they know exactly what that means. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, while many institutions tend to stick to the same definition, sometimes there might be others that kind of define things a little different. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to at least for an institution to define what asynchronous means mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. them. That way then a student knows what to expect and a faculty knows what to right. expect within that context. Yeah, I think uh, clear expectations are you know, particularly important with online uh, learning. So uh, that's, you know, being sure that you know everybody understands what the expectations are for the different kinds of styles that that would be uh, important, and you know I want to uh, kind of shift a little bit since we're focused on research methods in in method space uh, to you know ask you about uh, what you you know if there are uh, particular ways that you've used online learning or uh, worked with online learning to uh, support. Uh, students who are preparing uh, to do research. So w what are some of the strategies you've used in online learning to uh, to teach research methods and to support those kinds of students? Relisa, do you want to take that? All right. So, um... So mainly uh, we are looking at uh, some of the things that uh, we as uh, educators also kind of need to do when it comes to online learning. And one of the core things has been that before we even go to teach research online, there's really a need for us to adapt our research methods to an online format. It's one of the first things that we need to do because when you are teaching online, it's not necessarily the same when you are teaching in person. It also means that you need to do a lot of uh, preparation and also trying to prepare some content that um, students can access, whether they are engaging with you um, in a live session or asynchronously. All of that requires the need for educators to actually adopt these research methods to an online format to make it more interactive for the learners. And another thing to which is very important, when it comes to online, there's also a need for us to really um, deepen our communication skills when we are interacting with our learners, because um, whether you are writing or you are talking with them um, live, there's always a need to be very clear in communication because mm -hmm. um, when you do not communicate clearly, they sometimes may not get what you are trying to say. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for us to make our instructions clear and even our live interactions also very clear to our learners. So that way there is no kind of a disconnection with the information mm -hmm. that you are um, trying to give, all right? And also there's a need for us to give a lot of guidance to the students in their virtual research. So the instructions must be clear and what are some of the things that you may want to demonstrate. So that will actually depends on maybe the topic that you want to um, um, share or treat with the students and the kind of a pedagogical strategy you may want to use. The fact that it's online does not mean that we cannot actually show or demonstrate some of these um, activities to our learners in the live um, sessions or even if we have some kind of simulations for our learners. So these are also very, very important. And also, there's also a need for us to actually utilize our online resources and tools for data collection, data analysis, because when it comes to research, we have so many tools out there that um, our learners can use. And the whole idea is to ensure that we give them the tools that they need to be able to gather the necessary information and analyze data um, that you will gather from the field. So for example, if uh, learners need to do things like interviews, it's not always um, 
um, depending on the kind of or the nature of the research, some of these interviews can be conducted online as we are doing now in a live session with participants. Where in the, what we call it, the face-to-face, -face, you may want to actually meet the person one-on-one -on -one to do that. So in these scenarios, when we are online, it also gives us the opportunity to use all these flexible tools available to be able to, I mean, enhance this learning and also kind of uh, make it um, the data gathering more um, rich and also to be able to um, analyze it accurately in time. Okay, so um, this is a little bit I would like to share with regards to teaching research online um, within our, our context. Yes, yeah, so um, if anybody would like to add anything, please feel free. Escape from the <laughs> science, I was an Onesimus. <laughs> <laughs> How do you prepare your students to conduct research online or online students conducting their research? So the first thing I want to say is that students need to understand that the pedagogy for uh, the online environment is totally different. And I think we've alluded to that. Now, the fact is the student body is very broad. And so the instruction and everything is geared to that pattern. So students who come from a very narrow a description of the student body, suddenly find themselves with older students, students from different majors, students who are already on the job and people are working full-time instead of students full-time. All those nuances basically redefine the classroom. And it's not just textbook material. It is also work experience being brought in. Now, with the whole issue of AI and authentic assessments, that has totally changed everything now that um, even an exam is not the same way. Now, what you produce, the, the article that demonstrates that you have learned something is no longer that paper that you write or that exam or quiz that you take the assessments are taking a totally different pattern. Now, there's a lot of collaboration now, and the student has to put a lot more. I tell my students that in uh, the traditional system, if you came in on time and stayed in class the whole time and you are awake, quietly writing your notes, you are the perfect student. But in an online environment, you have to speak. People have to hear you, you have to contribute to the discussion. And that takes a lot of demand right. on the student because it's suddenly the roles are reversed. The teacher is basically listening and leveraging the discussion in the direction which it should take. But all this is basically happening and information is being generated by the students. So they're basically leading the process and they are a lot more visible. Now, um, there are definitely a lot of resources, especially now that we have the demand for online learning. There is a proliferation of material out there. There are so many things that can be used to enhance the classroom. What I'm totally fascinated with is how STEM courses have taken the lab experience online. And we have gaming, we have virtual realities, and we even have situations now where, you know, medical-based uh, courses even have those uh, virtual reality goggles that they put on and engage in conversation with other students who are in the very same room to experience the situation and do that. Now, one advantage I see in all of this is the perfect lab environment. I'm in the sciences, so that's my inclination to speak about this. And that is, you can imagine yourself doing a lab experiment and your lab partner is your teacher and you're walking through it. And the teacher is not only telling you what to do, but he's also assessing you in the process in how well you're doing. That is something we could not accomplish in the 
face-to-face uh, -face lab, or at least it was very difficult to do in a class where you have so many lab students. But with the type of products we have now, we, ha we are able to engage students one-on-one -on -one and then not only give them instructions, tie them to clues that have the theoretical principles of what they are testing, but we actually assess them in the process so that by the end of lab, you know how well the students learned. There is an article of this is their performance and so on. These are very extremely powerful tools that we now can use that were previously just not available. A couple of points I want to just uh, reinforce from from what uh, what you've said. I mean, when you know, for people who may be watching this who are not that familiar with online learning or just you know trying to get started with it, that you know, if we're talking about asynchronous, then we're talking about you know pretty much you're doing things in writing, primarily in writing. You are in a discussion in writing, so you are responding to prompts and you're responding to each other. And so, you know, on one end, as you say, I mean, you can't just sit there in the back of the room and and uh, try to look like, hmm, I hope she doesn't call on me because I didn't actually do the reading, but I'm going to look like I'm very attentive so that, you know, she'll think I'm on board. But you can't do that in an online class because you've got to respond in writing and you've got to reference your sources from the readings that were assigned and the research that you did. And all of those to me, you know, are, are research skills. You, those students are learning how to distill from the literature, whether it's a textbook or articles and put it into a, a coherent form and explain it and reference their sources that in a face-to-face -face class, maybe you just, you know, gave an extemporaneous <laughs> response to a question and, you know, maybe you made some of it up because you didn't always really read it. Uh, you, you know, you can't get away with that. You know, it's it, there. So there's a rigor that I think, you know, helps to prepare someone to be a researcher. And then, you know, thinking about some of the things that Relita was saying about the, you know, so if we're using synchronous and asynchronous and we're uh, looking at not only the online learning, but well, how might you use those skills as a researcher? You know, if we're doing research online, which of course is something that I've done a lot of writing about and thinking about, um, and you know, ways of incorporating some of those kinds of experiences into the form of your class. So, you know, if um, you know, we've talked a lot. The word collaboration has come up quite a bit. So, if we're you know looking at you know in a you know topic of having a small group discussion that you know is possible for people to do in an online class you know, perhaps, you know, in in a, particularly in a, a mixed synchronous and asynchronous, or it could be an asynchronous discussion, but, you know, where we're looking at, um, you know, I can practice interviewing, I can interview Kim, well, you know, what about, about her experience on this topic or about what she's learned from reading this. Well, I'm, I'm practicing those skills that I will then feel more confident about as a researcher. So to me, you know, it seems like we really have you know, great opportunity uh, to to build in those research skills, you know, as a part of the learning uh, experience. How, is that I, the way that you've approached it? I, I, I had not really thought about that, and I'm glad you brought that. And I, I was really hoping you'll talk about research because this is your field, the, the online research. And she has published a number of books and articles for those who have not, who don't know about that, just uh, just Google Janet Summons. <laughs> you will find a lot of books. She has published a lot of books with Sage as well and, uh, and articles on this. Um, these are things that are in direct learning, uh, research in direct learning, that happen without <clears throat> without us knowing. Because when you're doing re conducting research, guess what? You need to find resources online. And if you're an online student, you are you you are required to develop those skills to find and assess 
the, the quality of, uh, of resources. And so people who are taking online classes, obviously they have um, an advantage over people who are taking face-to-face -face classes, especially if it's just a traditional face-to-face -face classes where in some countries, students rely heavily on what the professor is bringing to the classroom. Um, this, uh, not only finding resources, but also writing. Uh, there are some students, because they take face-to-face -face classes, who, who may still re request other people to type their assignments for them. Uh, this may sound like strange, but it still happens today. But somebody who's taking classes online, guess what? You cannot keep asking people to type things for you. You'll have to develop those writing skills and uh, the technology you are able to, to develop uh, technical skills that will help you with that. One thing though that I wanted to add on research, it was the ethics. I, I, I find that there are some things that are different when we're conducting a study online. There are some ethical considerations that have to go online. Mm -hmm. Uh, that are not necessarily issues that we deal with with the face-to-face. -face. Uh, for example, in our university, if you are going to use Zoom to conduct interviews, for example, we, we are required not to use the camera because we have no way to to keep the confidentiality. Of course, we say, well, I know it is, mm -hmm. uh, it's a uh, password protected and everything, but the Zoom company still has the the access to all the data that is recorded so when we say we have confidentiality and privacy not not, not we cannot guarantee a hundred percent so that's why you know university we say okay you can use the audio of, of zoom but you cannot use the the camera so that there's one level of privacy right there. You know, the first time I heard this because I'm new to the university, it's been only a, a little bit over a year. It was like uh, shocking. It's like, because I want to see the expressions, facial expressions of the people that I'm interviewing, but I def quickly understood why this was a policy that we have in the university. Right. Well, before, before we go on to, to the next question, one of the uh, the points I wanted to, to ask you about, you know, from from the previous comments, you know, as we think about the th things of the, you know, the the need for one on one, you know, with the faculty and and the different roles, which I think you really described well, um, you know, in, in the, you know how the the active role that the student takes, you know, in this kind of environment that is that is different from the passive, you know, sitting in, in a lecture hall and try to look smart, um, you know, kind of thing. Uh, well, that, that you know, kind of ties into the question of class size, you know, so, you know, do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, and, and certainly as an instructor, you don't often have the choice about that that might be made, you know, at the university level, but, you know, looking at that sort of high touch versus the, you know, working with a with a large class and how some of these uh, strategies that you've described might be different. Is that something that you've uh, that you've talked about in in your chapters or or thought about with your work? I, I think Kim, you can take that class size is always one of those major issues. And since you have worked both in the classroom and in the corporate world, I think you can tell us what are the common practice is out there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so we really do try to recreate that high touch experience even in our higher enrollment courses. And what we've had to, you know, use for that is, is you know, again, the technology, we need to implement the technologies mm -hmm. that create kind of an instant feedback loop. We do a lot of things that will give instant feedback or will allow um, peers to give feedback to each other so that that touch can be implemented in the classroom, even if it can't always be the professor themselves, you know, going in and, and touching each student in a, a different way that way. Um, so we, we try to implement a little bit of um, the technologies that will support that high touch, even if, you know, and some of our classes, I have to tell you, for some of these global classes, they have about a thousand students. And so we have to try to teach them how to make sure that those students are getting, you know, instant feedback sometimes, um, you know, feedback that's really relevant to what they're they're saying. Um, so we, we mm -hmm. try to implement that the best that we can, that high touch function, even in the higher enrollment classes, which is actually more, more available to us 
in an online setting than it is in a face-to-face a -face class. Well, uh, um, I know we have a, a limited amount of time and you know many things to discuss, but I wanted to make sure that we had a chance to talk about uh, you know, the implications of a global classroom, which, you know, you referred to a couple of times. And I know with uh, Emerge Africa, working with, you know, people throughout the continent who have very different languages and different cultures, you know, even within one, you know, within one continent, I know, you know, where certainly where I live, there are, you know, many cultural differences, you know, in a, in a small geographic area. But when you're bringing in such diverse uh, students, you know, what are some of the kinds of issues that that you've, uh, you know, thought about and, and discussed in this book that would be uh, helpful to our method space community? Relief, yeah. do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, oh, okay. Uh, I'll speak um, generally about how we manage the diversity mm -hmm. and how we have people coming from different spaces. One of the core things we really focus on within Emerge Africa is that we want to create that um, collaborative space where peer learning can even happen beyond the course. Mm -hmm. So we really even um, make a conscious effort to help people deal with diversity and also rather see the richness within diversity. So we we kind of make people aware that you come to the course as an individual, but by the time you exit, you have all these um, course colleagues uh, that you can connect with and network with beyond the course. So that kind of um, engagement you may have with the traditional learning environment where you have your classmates, we try to simulate that by the way we structure our course activities so that people will have the chance to really interact and get to know each other. Okay, so we really make an effort within our interactions to get people talking as they would in person on, I mean, social things and other things, not just always cause activities. Mm -hmm. So they really build those relationships as they go. And um, issues around communication too is very important because like I mentioned, people are coming from diverse backgrounds. So language is really um, important here. So one thing you say might make different to another person. So we even have to make a conscious effort to get people to understand that we are diverse. And there's a need for us to really appreciate our diversity and how we respond, how we engage and all of that and really Dealing with diversity is really even a hot topic to even discuss to make people aware of the fact that we need to be very accommodative and learn how to respond in the online space because one of the things we spoke about was that within the online space, once you put your feedback there, it's there. So mm -hmm. when you, you are not careful or mindful about how you communicate there, it might really not be the best for everyone. So you really need mm -hmm. to be mindful of how you interact. So these are really very light things, but it really does help us with how we manage um, people from diverse backgrounds. And the beauty is that we really get different inputs from people and we learn from different um, disciplines due to the diversity. So that's the beauty within the Image Africa space that we have, yeah. If I may add to that, I think, uh, there's definitely power in collaboration and there's power in diversity. Uh, we, over the dec past, several past decades, people were, just didn't want to, to, to embrace the diversity, but now we cannot resist that anymore. Um, linking what Ralisa was sharing with us uh, to our handbook, I think that, that this is the strength, that the, one of the major strengths of our handbook. Uh, we intentionally looked around the world uh, for contributors from many different countries, I don't I don't remember exactly how many countries are represented, but we have uh, uh, contributors from all the the continents instead of uh, except uh, Antarctica, I think. Um, <laughs> but the rest of the continents, we really cover them. And as we were looking at the different chapters that were coming, you could feel, you could hear the voices. We could hear the challenges 
you could hear the the wealth of knowledge that is usually not in the mainstream scholarship of online mm -hmm, education. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I, I think this will help, this will be very helpful in uh, contextualizing online education because not what, how, what works in the United States will work in China. What works in China will not necessarily work in Cambodia or in, uh, in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And so having these voices and, and looking even at the statistics, there were some statistics that were brought in from different regions. It was really, really um, eye-opening uh, to see online education from the global perspective, right. not just right. uh, the Western side. Well, it, it, and I mean, when when I was an early adopter for online learning, I mean, one of the things that was fascinating to me was that, I mean, you know, since I'm based in the U.S., the U.S. was not necessarily the leader in this field, and that you know, incredibly creative and interesting approaches were being developed all over the world. In and fun fact. That's how I got interested in online interviewing because when I was doing my dissertation that uh, was about collaboration and online learning, um, I thought, well, I don't want to just interview people in the US or people who even I could access on the phone, you know, with a, you know, in an easy call, you know, I need to be able to talk to people around the world and how could I do that? Well, this kind of technology was, uh, available and so you know that that's what interested me in doing in this whole field but you know to me I, I keep coming back to all of the things that we t are, are talking about are also foundational research skills you know when you're talking about the 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 how it uh, the the um embrace of diverse voices and people coming from different backgrounds different levels of experience and, you know, we know how, I mean, how easy it is, you know, to become, you know, offended or or to be like, mm, they don't understand me, you know, kind of feeling like I don't fit here. Um, you know, I'm different from these other people. They don't get me, you know, and, and you know, that that can be um, either aided or or uh, um, uh, exacerbated by, you know, what's online. And if we're if we're it's asynchronous where it's a lot, a lot of the communication is in writing that once, you know, you've posted that comment, it's there and everybody can see it in the class. Um, so, you know, learning those, you know, respectful ways of listening, responding, being supportive. And even if you're thinking this person is, you know, really out, out, uh, you know, off the wall and this is, you know, they did a terrible job on this, on this, my feedback is going to be like, you know, start over. This was terrible. Well, you know, you know, how can you, how can you give constructive feedback, you know, that's going to actually, you know, help that person to improve rather than just being like, oh, this is terrible. Well, guess what, you know, those are important skills for scholars because we need to do peer reviews. You know, that's one of the roles that we take and we can learn how to do that by, you know, the process that we use in an online class. Um, but, you know, re really take some careful, some careful thought and kind of checking yourself. I mean, I know, you know, there are things that I might say that, you know, would be, um, perfectly acceptable in, you know, some setting, but somebody else might think that it's offensive, you know, taken out of context. So, uh, you know, it, I think it, it really takes a lot of uh, reflection on the part of both the, the faculty member and the student to, to really, to really think about it and, and maybe to ask, you know, I'm not sure, you know, would you prefer that I call you um, by your first name? Or would you prefer that I called you Mr. Uh, you know, those kinds of things, just the, the ways that people interact, how they um, address one another, you know, that may be something you didn't even think about, but, you know, could really make a difference for, for whether someone felt that they are, yes, I fit, I fit in this class and, and I have something, my contributions are uh, welcomed. And if I do a bad job, people are going to help me make it better. 
So as we, um, uh, for the the last question to to uh, close our uh, discussion here, even though you know we could talk for a long time, I'm I think, um, what are you know some of the new technologies and approaches that you see are um, valuable for uh, online teaching and learning, and you know how are those uh, discussed in the handbook? Do you want to start, Safari? Let's go to Kim because okay. she has All bring right. a lot of the technology. Uh, let's go to her and then I can add from there if necessary. So my background, I have a doctorate, an educational doctorate in learning technology. So I always love to talk technologies, which you'll see as a thread as I've spoken here. Um, we cannot even move forward without saying AI is uh, the, probably the biggest thing coming. And so Onesimus has already said that COVID was a big hit. I think AI is going to be a big influencer in and how we learn in the future as well. Um, and the way that we've implemented that, you know, it, it, where I am at Arizona State University, we've we've had groups get together and talk about, you know, both the benefits and the the challenges, the the problems that might arise with it. And we're it's a flood right now. We're not ready for everything that's coming. Um, but I can see so many benefits. And when we go back to that idea of that, you know, this is a global education system. One thing I'm seeing is there's a disparity between what we have available in the West versus what the world has available. For example, ChatGPT, you needed a number that was um, from the United States, Asia, or, or Europe to be able to get ChatGPT first, right? So that creates a whole section of our world that can't even access something like that. So, you know, trying to create less disparity while using it for the benefit of learning and not making it do the thinking for us. These are all things that are swirling around, I think, mm -hmm. with AI. And that's, it. I think, going to be the biggest thing that we have to deal with now post-COVID. If I can add something to that, and, and definitely I agree that AI, that's uh, that's where we're headed. Uh, while some people are still trying to integrate uh, computers in the classroom, uh, the world now is with uh, with AI. Um, I want to speak from a developing country perspective. Uh, some people believe that when you're talking about online education, you must be an expert in technology. That is not necessarily true. Uh, you can really do teach quality online. Um, you, you can deliver a quality online education with that, with with just the the skills that you have. You just need to hire the IT people to support you to support your work. The other thing is that we need to take technology as a tool. It's not what will do our work. It will not do the thinking for us. I know AI now can think for us, but we still have to bring in our own brain. So let's not feel like, okay, we, we are going to be driven by the technology. Let's drive the technology. Yeah. The other point I want to mention is to make sure we do not push and this we talked we I think we discussed this in the um, the Mastercard Foundation trainings for, for for Africa let's not try to integrate all the technologies that are out there that is a tendency of people who are new to online education mm -hmm. or new to the integration of technology in the classroom they think that everything that's under the sun we need to integrate that choose what is needed mm -hmm. and what is affordable Sometimes programs fail because people are asking, for example, uh, for, for uh, learning management systems, Moodle is very well used uh, globally and it is free. Even prestigious universities here in the United States are using that. We we'll find people who are new to online education, they have limited funds, they say, no, we want Canvas. I'm not speaking against Canvas, but you know, mm -hmm. you, you need to have a lot of resources to be able to pay for Canvas or any other uh, similar web city or things like that, because they are really, ex the commercial ones are very expensive. So let's be reasonable, let's be practical, embrace the technology that you need and that you can afford and that people can learn easily because that's the other issue. You know, it may be, it may be free, but it's extremely hard to learn. That is also another thing that we, we need to keep in mind. And we have, a, a, I think, a, a, in the technical considerations, we talk about that. We have a whole chapter on that. You can read that in the handbook. 
Okay, is, is there anything else that uh, anyone would like to add before we uh, close our conversation? I, I think I just want to let people know that this book is uh, coming out uh, this November 2023. So any time it will be it should be released and uh, we encourage people to get a copy. You can get the copy from the Sage Publishers website or get it from Amazon. Or if you live in um, Europe or, or Asia or, or or the United States and Canada, you'll be able to find that also in your uh, bookstores, most likely. And so yeah, we encourage people to get those who really who really work with online education. Most of the times mm -hmm. they should get their personal copies. But if you if you don't do a whole lot of work online, you can just recommend your, your library to get a copy. It is fully packed, fully packed with knowledge from all over the world. And it is something that you want to definitely have, get hold of. Well, thank you uh, all for uh, taking the time to uh, have this conversation. And uh, I hope that for those who are viewing this, you've gotten some ideas about uh, ways to um, either incorporate online learning uh, into your uh, teaching approaches or to uh, gain some new insights into the techniques that you're already using. Thank you for letting us come. It's been a pleasure to meet with you all. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much.